What's going on, everybody? It is Triple Crown 24 of a new episode of the Sports Card Psychology Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Continue to great, continue to get great feedback on this series. Continue to trip over my own words as well. Uh, today's show, we're going to be talking about eye appeal, as you can tell by the thumbnail if you're listening here on YouTube. And particularly with eye appeal, it's a term that we use in the hobby to describe vintage cards. Now, there is certainly plenty of applicable uh, places where you can put in I appeal with modern cards, but I hear it often, especially when you're talking about condition, because condition comes in such a wide range with vintage cards. So my guest today is a pretty well-versed on the subject matter. He is Jake from Legends Never Die on YouTube. Jake, how you doing? Great, JT, man. Glad to finally make it on a uh, episode of Sports Psychology. And uh, when you asked me about this particular topic, you know it's right up my alley. So I was excited to get on and talk about I appeal with vintage cards, man. Exactly. And you have a, a different style than what I think most of us have in the hobby right now. But I think that so many people can learn from your style. And we always talk about this on the show that we don't always do things the same but we want to understand others better and learn from others. And I think you are a great example of that. So I can't wait to pick your brain a bit about vintage cards. Um, let's just dive into vintage cards in general. What is your interest in them? Like, why do you go after vintage cards or what kind of cards do you go after? Yeah. So the reason I'm interested in vintage personally is I want my collection to tell the story of the history of the game. Uh, and I think you can't do that uh, without vintage cards. Um, and I think a lot of the foundation of the history of the game is made up of the pioneers and the players that started it, the all-time greats, the Hall of Famers. And for the most part, those are guys that are retired, which in turn usually means vintage. And that's why I've operated in that sphere very often for my own personal collection. Makes sense. I don't know that if you guys are familiar with Jake's channel, if you're not, be sure to go check him out on YouTube. Legends Never Die, as you see here. Might formerly know him as a Ticket Leprechaun now with the channel name. Got a great avatar, great channel overall. But yeah, exactly that. And I think a lot of people like to have what's called like a well-rounded collection where they want to have uh, cards that really tell the history of really whatever interests them. If you're like a team collector, we'll tell the history of your team. If you're just a fan of a sport in, in general, uh, pretty much like you are, I know that you are a Braves fan. You do like your brave stuff, but uh, you do have a very well-rounded collection. Um, and you do have a lot of great players and you have their playing days cards uh, back from the 50s, 60s, even earlier than that. So when we talk about vintage cards, let's kind of break down the different elements of a card. And this, this could go for anything in general. Um, but when we're talking about it, we're going to break it down to kind of the scale that we use when we talk about grading cards. So this is the same subgrade categories as you would see used through a service such as Beckett or CSG if you were to use their subgrade option. But these are things that are considered too if you're someone who picks up your vintage cards or grades your vintage cards and PSA or SGC holders, they're still looking over these same things. And the big four of those, it would be centering, corners, edges, and surface. And then there's kind of this fifth one that I guess you could kind of tie it into surface a little bit. It's called registration. Uh, it's a bit different because you can have surface issues with excellent registration and vice versa. But it's one that we don't really talk about too much. And for modern cards, registration is not nearly as much of an issue just because of how much printing has improved in terms of quality. Uh, mm -hmm since we first started seeing the birth of the modern card. But talk about you specifically, Jake, what uh, is most important to you? If you had to pick an example of a card out and you want to have as good as you can get on one of those five areas, what are you going after most often? For me, I think the most important one is still centering. Um, I don't mind if a card is a little off center, you know, 60, 40, maybe even 70, 30, left to right or top to bottom. But any more than that, it's like an automatic no to me. Just from an eye appeal perspective, if I take a look at a card and it's 80-20, I don't care if the corners are perfect. I don't care if the registration is perfect. Everything else would be great. It, you know, it's it's thrown out in my mind. Uh, for me, I would rather have a card that would grade like a two, but is centered nicely 
as opposed to one that may be a, a six, you know, with that miscut or off center qualifier. I know people hate their qualifiers. We'll get more into qualifiers in a little <laughs> bit when if you're a, if you're a graded card fan. But yeah, centering that's mine too. Um, these are little tiny pieces of art, and to me, it's if you go to I don't know whatever big box store and you just want to get some generic piece of art to hang up on your wall, you probably wouldn't buy something that's off centered. It's just <laughs> it doesn't look right, um, and. That seems to be a general consensus that I see largely. So I did a poll on Twitter ahead of today's episode, and it didn't get enough of a sample size where we can say definitively that centering is generally considered the most important in the hobby. But around, I think it was 40 to 50 votes on this poll, uh, about 70% chose centering as their number one. So it seems like that is pretty much the consensus. Would you agree with that, that mostly people who you converse with about the hobby they generally go after centering or do you know guys who are like yeah i'm a big corner guy or i'm a big registration guy uh and then kind of after centering what's number two do you think i also operate in a group called obc old baseball cards it's a uh vintage group where we just send around cards to each other and it's it's very low grade some people may think that i collect low grade where things are like ones and twos these guys collect things commonly with writing on them, pieces missing, things like that. Now, they are a niche piece of the market, but there are people out there that care more about the corners, uh, simply about no pieces missing of the card um, or the registration. Um, because in addition to what you talked about, the main four and registration kind of being a fifth, uh, there's also color, you know, for a vintage card where the registration may be great on, say, you know, a 56 Clemente, but the color is kind of washed out in the background because it's been overexposed to sunlight over a long period of time or something like that. So color, you know, is another one that I think uh, vintage collectors look at in terms of eye appeal. For myself, like part of your question that you asked, JT, uh, behind centering for me, second for me would be registration um, because it could be centered perfect, you know, perfect corners, edges, all of that, no writing, no marks, you know, a great looking card. But if the image is blurry and it looks like I have three Ted Williams on the card instead of one, um, I'd rather have the great registration on a, a card with maybe some rougher corners or something like that. I'm the exact same way. When when you say that, it immediately pops into my mind and anytime anyone mentions registration as it comes to vintage cards. So one of my projects I did back in the day was put together all of the tops cards that picture a Detroit Tigers player on them. Mm -hmm. And I remember my 1972, I think it was Billy Martin, is yeah. just he, he looks like a ghost to the photo because of how poor the registration was. Mm -hmm. So I had to upgrade that eventually just because it would bug me anytime I went I went through that page. Um yeah, color is a big one. We're going to touch on that here in a, in a moment. I'm really glad that you brought that up because that was something that kind of uh, went over my head earlier when I was doing the show notes for today's show. But it's extremely important, especially when you're talking about vintage. I think to kind of wrap up on the centering point, one of the big reasons we like to talk about different social theories or psychology ideas on this show, usually they're more modern. And by modern, I mean 50s or newer. This one's going a little prehistoric here. So this dates back to the days of Plato. I'm sure most people didn't think that I'd be referencing Plato on today's show, but it's this idea that uh, symmetry is greatly uh, appealing to the human eye. It goes mm -hmm. to Plato's theory of proportions, where we want to see things that are equal across the board, and it bugs us. That's why we try to complete certain things. We try to, you have like a stack of books that are all crooked. You want to push all the books together, make them all nice and neat because proportionally they're off. And it's something that triggers this uh, incompleteness in our mind. And it, for some reason, it's it's a very huge detriment to the ego to have something that's like incomplete mm -hmm. or maybe uh, a little bit out of line. So I do, uh, I do definitely agree, you know, centering is king for most people. Let's talk about color. So color is very interesting because different colors can kind of elicit a different response from us. So among the cards in your collection, what are some of the favorites? And do you notice if there's like any certain colors that really stand out to you or just in general thinking about cards that maybe you want to pick up? Is there a certain card that because of the color you want to go after it? Sure. So 
I, I collect sets uh, from 1933 Gowdy up through 1979 Tops. I'm almost as bad as Dean Gearhart. I just do baseball. Uh, but as far as cards that jump out at me because of their color, because of their background, is for some reason to me, dark green background cards just pop. There's something about a green background vintage card that just says baseball to me. And I actually had a conversation with uh, Don, Don's Field of Dream Cards, about this very topic. And I said, I, I think that maybe why that jumps out to me, because you think about vintage baseball, the grass is green. A lot of times the, the backs of the insides of the dugouts were green. The old seats in the stadium were green. The railings were green. It, just something about that says baseball. So the two cards that jump out to me, as a Braves fan, as I wear a Mariners hat, uh, Braves fan first, baseball fan second, uh, are the 1958 tops of both Warren Spawn and Hank Aaron. Uh, they have green backgrounds. The Braves colors are not green, <laughs> but something about them just make them pop. And that is a, a card especially that if those backgrounds were faded out, uh, they didn't have a high quality of color, I would not want to pick up that card for an eye appeal reason. Uh, because that green background to me is something that make that card special. There are a few things there that I've never even considered before. So you, you blew my mind a little bit. Anyone who's watching <laughs> on YouTube too can see that like you got the green sweatshirt on today too. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're definitely keeping it consistent with the theme here. Gr green is such an interesting color because I know a few people that that's their favorite. Is green your favorite color? Just it is. I used to be a leprechaun, so not surprising, but yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, see, that's what I was thinking, but that's, yeah, okay. So that makes sense. But green is a color that I, I was looking at my show notes here while you explained that and just looking over the different colors and kind of picking out which one that you would kind of go with. And green is one that indicates balance, which just ties in so perfectly to mm. the idea of the proportions and centering being so important. And uh, registration where you have that balance where all of the layers of the card, so to speak, come together with your background image, your, uh, the outlining of the player, if, if that's the case, the text on the card as well, if you're in terms of player name, team name, uh, position, whatever else may be in the card or, or even the back. And you mentioned a few great examples. I think that's why 58 tops, it's a set that I've always been kind of iffy about, but they have those like solid green backgrounds. And I know that you know you have a few of those. And I think your Braves players, isn't the Braves, I want to say the majority of them have a green background in that set? Am I mistaken? The about majority, that? if not all, actually. I'm not sure if it's all, but I know several of those and some of the commons also have green backgrounds. Uh, the Babu does, Cheryl does. So maybe, maybe. Another common color that we see in the background is blue. And there's some pretty classic cards that have blue backgrounds. The 52 Tops Mantle, one of the most iconic cards of all time, has a blue background. Uh, even, you go, you're earlier to the Mantle Rookie in 51, Bow, and you kind of have that sky blue background. And there's a lot of, like, sky blue colors, too. If you see a card that has a blue background, what does that signify to you? When it's funny that you brought up light blue, because that would have been my second choice for a color that kind of sticks out to me for baseball. And it it ties into the whole basis for this this podcast, sports card psychology, right? Most people like baseball because they feel romantic about it in some way. They feel nostalgia for it. You know, thinking about a, a better time, uh, a perfect day, a perfect experience at the ballpark, right? Well, everything I said about green you know, it being a great day at the ballpark, the grass, the stadium, the seats, all of that also applies to a great day at the ballpark from the sky. It's Tar Heel Blue, right? You have a beautiful day at the at the ballpark and you look up at the sky, sun shining, no clouds. It's Tar Heel Blue. And I think that's a color that people, when they see it, associate it with a, a positive feeling. And in terms of baseball, you know, with a positive experience at the ballpark. See, you blew my mind the first time that you're talking about the green grass analogy, and then the, you're, you're bringing in the sky too. Like that's, <laughs> that makes, it just makes so much sense, but it's something that I hadn't really considered that before, but yeah, you're, you're right. Like that 
to me, I can picture exactly what you're saying from those words, like the blue sky in the background. You don't want to go to a game when it's dark, gray, like storm mm -hmm. clouds rolling over. Um, so if we're, let's let me build on that. Since you you have the grass is green, the sky is bright and blue. You know the Tar Heel blue. We'll say the sun is out too. So the sun typically we're going to associate that with the color yellow, a very warm color. Is that the kind of the sense that you get from yellow? Is that one that appeals to you with with cards? I know that there's a few classic cards out there. Probably the most notable being the T206 Wagner that has that mm -hmm. yellow. Uh, what kind of a response does that get from you when you see that color on a card? We're we're really getting uh you know psychological here, JT. Uh, but when I see yellow, the first thing I do think of is the sun. Uh, but when I think of the sun, if you're watching us on YouTube, I think about going like this, <laughs> you know, kind of blind and be like, oh, you know, and you're going to take that, I guess, one of two ways, either. Wow. That's, that's bright. Like I don't even want to look at that or wow, that's bright. That really stands out. Um, not to keep beating the same set to death, but the Clemente in 58 tops is a yellow background and it's a full body shot of him with the bat. Um, but that card does jump out at you with the yellow background. Um, and so does the Gibson from the next year, 59, which I don't know if we're going to get into to pink cards. Um, but people talk about that as the Pepto-Bismol card. You know, it stands out because it's unique and, it, and it's pink. It's a bright card that jumps out at you. Um, I think the bright colors tend to evoke the kind of emotions that we're talking about, um, where the the more aggressive or darker colors, uh, I would say may not evoke the same emotion. Would you agree, JT? I totally agree. That's a, a perfect segue because you, I mean, pink is a card that we don't really see too often. I think that's what makes the Bob Gibson rookie so unique is because there's just not that many like pink cards that come to mind. Like that, that's really the only one I'm thinking here, just trying to go through it. If there's a few, I know the Tigers have a few cards in 58 tops, like the Jim Bunning has a pink background, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, just mm -hmm. off the top of my head here. Um, but really like pink and purple, you don't see it too often with that. And I, pink, in some cases, it could be if it's a softer pink, then maybe it doesn't jump out as more. But if it's like a hot pink or a more of an electric pink, then it does have that. It's a little bit more bold. And one of the words that you use is aggressive. So purple, I think it could go either way, to, depending on the shade. Um, when we think of aggressive and colors that jump out, uh, there's been studies on this too about what colors really jump out. And um, I hear this too of like never buy a red car because you're going to get pulled over because the cops right. are going to go after the red car for speeding. Um, and that that jumps us into the color red. It's a color that we associate with aggressive. It's a very powerful color. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like backgrounds on cards, there's not too many that come to mind immediately when I think of red. They're usually sticking to more of those earth tones, your your yellows, your blues, your greens, kind of the uh, off tone or, or mixes of the two. Why do you think it is that we don't see too many of these really bold red cards or the use of red more in vintage cards? Probably because it evokes an, an extreme reaction to one way or the other. So to tie yellow and red together, you know, the analogy I use for the sun of either what, like, wow, that pops or wow, I don't want to look at that. Uh, I think of, to mention a different set, the Diamond Stars set, you know, from the 30s. I think that's very much a set of either you love it or you hate it <laughs> because partially that deco art style, but largely because of the colors, because every card, if not almost every card, use yellow and red. And I mean, they they really, they scream at you. They, they pop for better or for worse because of those two loud, aggressive colors. What do you think of, of that, JT? What do you think of that set? I think that you're spot on. I mean, for me personally, I'm I'm going to contradict your point. I'm kind of indifferent to it. Like, I think it's like, I don't hate it, but I don't like love it. But I think that's the thing too, where there's so many vintage sets where I feel that you, you just can't help but fall in love with them. Like there are mm -hmm. certain sets, even the ones that I don't really like from the 50s and 60s, they're still classics, and I, I definitely admire them when I see them. Like 66 Tops, for example, I think is kind of bland. It just has the, the name plate at the bottom and the one little slash at the top with the with the team name on it. It doesn't do much for me personally. It's just a little bit too simple, I think, for the time, especially with how much I really do enjoy 65 with the pennants. I think mm -hmm. that's just so cool. But the color on it is just 
I mean, it, it does something for me. Like it's just enough color and they, they do a good job, I think, of mixing the different colors in. So I definitely agree with that. Um, I want to jump to just modern for just a second, because if we're talking about vintage, we don't necessarily get the chance to talk about parallels. Mm -hmm. And I would say some of the more popular parallels, if you look at, we'll talk about Topps flagship. The golds and the blacks are some of the most sought after because they have the longevity. Those are the OG parallels. And if you were to go after one of the newer age parallels, probably the Independence Day is one of the more fan favorites, particularly the first release because 2018 Tops Independence Days are absolutely beautiful. Um, but really, in, and even in basketball and football too, if you want to look at the, like the prism stuff, the golds, because they're out of 10, I think, are very sought after people love the golds people love the blacks because they're one of ones but those are colors that we really didn't talk about before we did talk about yellow a bit why do you think in the in the modern sense that the most popular parallels aren't necessarily the colors that we talked about earlier like your greens like green is actually probably one of the more hated colors among more modern ones and blue uh, there's a lot of people who do enjoy the blues but do you think it's a, a scarcity thing or do you just think that it it's different with modern cards, the different colors that appeal to us. I think that gold and black, silver, generally go with everything. They can augment whatever your team's colors are. A, a term I've heard you use several times on your channel, you call it the color match parallel, right? So like for the Tigers, you've got the orange and blue. You know, their cards naturally look better orange and blue. If you're a fan of the Tigers, you already like those colors. So you see that associated with your card for your player, your team, you're probably going to like that card more, right? So for black, for gold, for silver, they can augment pretty much any team's colors. But other than that, the color match, I think, is what is most appealing uh, for, in terms of modern cards. Uh, and what you mentioned about green, I think is true because for... Uh, the very few modern cards that I do have, if I had a green parallel for a Braves card, generally I don't like it. Uh, the color that's probably worse for me for modern cards is if I see a purple parallel, I'm like, why? Why? This doesn't go with anyone's, any team's colors. Why are they doing this? Um, so I know you are a believer in color match because you mentioned it several times. Uh, yeah, I mean, if we're if we're focusing on modern here, then absolutely, because there's just so many parallels that it's you you kind of have to pick and choose like what is important. And, and personally, you mentioned that I'm a Tigers fan, and I don't really like the color orange. Like the only time I like the color orange is if I'm sipping on a mimosa or I'm half in my Tigers gear on. That's the only time that I'm really an orange guy. But I love the orange refractors with the Tigers. They just look so good because mm -hmm. of that association that we draw. Um, back in the day, it seemed to be a bit more random in terms of the colors that they used. And, you know, the, the quality control, I guess, back then wasn't as good. And maybe people didn't really, they didn't think about these decisions as much. There's probably bigger issues to worry about. Do you think that there's some missed opportunities with certain sets to really capitalize on what we call the color match now back then? Like, so for example, like a 58 top. So you think if your Braves cards had like a blue or a red, like a soft blue or red background that would change them? Or do you, do you think that they're fine the way they are? It's tough to look back at vintage in a lot of cases and say, oh, I would change that because they've become such classic images that you just expect and that's what you associate it with. Um, that being said, I think that they would still be more appealing in a lot of cases, if they were color matched to their teams. Uh, I only think that that can positively reinforce associating that player, that team with that card because of the colors. Uh, because to flip-flop... We could probably do a whole show on colors. I mean, let's... <laughs> we probably could. And to, to jump back to modern for just a second, um, believe it or not, I've done one rainbow ever in my life, and it wasn't a Braves fan. Um, I really liked Brian Wilson. I'm a big beard guy. Uh, and I'm doing the 2012 Topps Chrome uh, rainbow of that card. Uh, I think it's 2012, where he comes off the mound and he's going like this. Um, but the orange, right? You were talking about orange. Generally, orange doesn't go with anything. But the Giants and the orange refractor of Wilson, it just made sense. It looks really, really cool. It's a nice card. 
Uh, and we could keep going on color and on and on, but I just wanted to point that out. I absolutely agree. Well, what we'll the maybe we'll do a follow up show. You guys, if you're watching on YouTube, let us know in the comments you want to hear a, a follow up where we dive more into colors because I mean, like we can get the Crayola box out and really examine everything <laughs> in there if we really wanted to. Um, let's kind of move to the topic of raw versus great. And this is kind of like our kind of uh, I guess final pitch, final uh, uh, last call on on the subject of eye appeal. Uh, you're a raw card collector i am give us a give us a background of why you prefer raw cards before we dive more into this sure uh so i know mike baseball collector will listen to this so i'm gonna pick on him for a second so he has been quoted as saying many times buy the card not the great i just want to own an example of the card get it respect that no problem with that i also understand the position of wanting to look at a, a card and grading it and it's protected and you know what it is. And, you know, whoever inherits your card someday knows what it is. I understand all that. But zooming in on the point of buy the card, not the grade. If that is the real point, coupled with another thing that he says often, which is I want to stretch my hobby dollar as long as it can go, right? Who doesn't want to do that? Everybody wants to do that. You know, the further you can stretch it, the more things you can add to your collection that you want. So if you want to accomplish those two things, why would you need a third party to tell you that you like the way this card looks and spend more of your money to do that than you could have bought other cards for your collection? You know, uh, John Mangini recently had uh, put out a video about having someone grade graded cards and how silly that was that people are doing that. Well, to me, it's not much different than a third party doing it in the first place. Um, I can look at a card and say, I like the eye appeal of this card. Maybe the corners are a little rounded, centering's a little off, but the eye appeal for me, beauty in the eye beholder, I like this card. I'm gonna buy this card for 20 bucks. Or I could buy the graded card, just like it, that's graded a two for 40 bucks and then not have $20 to spend on something else. So the reason I'm a raw collector is because I can add more things to my collection if I collect cards in the raw form. Um, I feel like I don't need somebody else to tell me that I like the way this card looks. Um, again, not to knock it too much. I'm joking. I'm in jest uh, that I understand all the reasons of why you would want to collect graded cards, but that's why I don't. I, th I think that's a fair point with how slab happy we are in the hobby today. I say we as, as a collective whole of how many just, when you go to shows, you just see so many slabs out there and there's still quite a few um, vintage tables that I see that are all raw or at least 90% plus raw uh, where you can go through the, the sets that are nicely laid out in the binders and kind of pick out stuff for your set. Uh, there's definitely a lot of my, my Tigers team set, for example, none of the cards in it are graded. They're all raw. Um, and I like it that way because I like to have them all raw in the binder all together. I don't really want to like... Mm -hmm. um, take a picture of it and then slide that in or, or try to find like a reprint to slide in. Like I, I just want to have the raw card there. So I totally get that too. too. Yeah. Binders forever. Binders <laughs> forever. Yeah. But you're not afraid to buy a, a graded card if you think it's the right price and you, and you mm -hmm. want to go after that. So uh, when you're looking to add your collection with vintage, do you find that it's easier to get a card that you really like for a price that you are happy with raw or graded and why? Raw, for sure, um, because uh, I do most of my research and how I evaluate cards based on raw cards or ones that are graded low one or two and use that as a benchmark. And I try and get it under that uh, because inherently, you know, someone paid for the service to have a card graded. Therefore, it has more inherent value because it's the card plus the service that's been added to it. So I, I get the value proposition there. And typically because of that, because there's not a lot of psychos like me that'll crack cards out of cases and put them in their binders, uh, when people are selling those cards, they want more money for them. You know, to uh, a few, very few uh, rare exceptions, you know, every once in a while, both vintage and modern, you hear somebody say, you know, I could buy this card for less than the cost of grading. And, you know, that does happen upon occasion. Now I will say, 
that on the big, big cards, unless I'm buying it from a dealer that I know and trust, or if I'm doing it in person, if I'm buying online, for example, my 56 Tops Mantle, uh, when I bought it about five years ago, I bought it online. I did buy it graded. It was a PSA 3. I cracked it out. Some of you are cringing, uh, but I put it in my binder. Uh, but that's what I did because I wanted to know that it was a, an authentic card. You know, 56 Tops Mantle is a big card, more likely to be counterfeited. Or if you were buying a, you know, a vintage Ruth. Um, or a really big uh, rookie card, if it was a, the 52 mantle. You know, if I bought one of those, I would buy it graded. I would crack it out like a crazy person, but I would buy it graded for authenticity purposes. But to answer your original question, generally, it's easier for me to find a deal from my collection on a card that is already raw. See, that's interesting to me. And I, I'm sure a lot of people were curious why that you would crack them out, because I think that's that's kind of... I don't want to say it's taboo because that implies that it's like not normal or whatever, but it's just, I don't it's think it's not. something that we see too. Well, it's something that we don't see as often as people who uh, get the cards and send them in. And that kind of goes to my point here is that a lot of times I see a lot of raw vintage dealers who believe it is a certain grade. If you were to send mm -hmm. it into your uh, third party grading service of choice. And when you're looking at it in that grade, they're kind of basing their price off of that. Maybe they're basing it off of IPL. These vintage dealers have been doing it for a long time. So do I trust their judgment? A lot of times, yes. It, it, inherently, if you do something enough and you repeat the same actions over and over with accurate results, chances are you will most likely be accurate in this case, too. Not saying that they don't miss things. I've seen it plenty of times, um, but they're they're generally pretty good about it. Uh, do you have a problem often with people who you think maybe overvalue their cards and, or maybe give them a little bit too much credit where they say like, oh, well, this is excellent condition, but you're, you're more like, ah, eh, maybe this is good to very good. Is that ever a really a barrier when you're buying raw? Because when, when you have it graded, you know, it's, it's not that it's definitive end all be all because not all mm -hmm. grades are created equal. Um, but at least there is that third party to kind of be the mediator and say like, this is a four. This is this is very good to excellent condition. And that way you guys kind of have more of a, uh, I guess, a common ground to go off of when you're negotiating. Sure. You had a couple different points in there. The, the first one, why would I crack cards out? I, I'm, a, I'm a set builder. I'm a set collector. And I like all the cards at home together in the binder. I don't want to do the insert or, you know, go look somewhere else for my graded cards, that kind of thing. Um, if I was just doing the Hall of Famers, or just doing a certain card, one card from a set, maybe I'll leave it graded. For example, I own the 8687 Fleer Michael Jordan Rookie. It's graded um, because I'm not doing the set. I have no real reason to bust it out. I don't have a binder for it. Um, so that's why I do that. Um, as far as what you mentioned about, you know, having difficulty with maybe a dealer to show saying, hey, I, I think this card would grade a six or a seven. Um, it's raw. I think that situation differs at different ends of the spectrum. And what I mean by that is I don't collect mid-grade or high-grade vintage. And I think you see that what you're talking about happen more often in the arena where you do collect uh, those type of grade of cards, where it does really matter if, okay, I think this card's a little more off-center than you do. I think this corner is a little more ding than you think it is, or this fisheye would knock it down to a, a five or, or whatever it is. Where the cards that I'm typically buying would probably never grade higher than a three most of the time. Most of the cards I buy are a one or a two, dinged up corners, but nice, what I would call eye appeal. Um, and there's not as much, oh, well, I think it would grade a two, not a one. You know, that doesn't really happen as, as much. Uh, unless it's a really big card, like a 53 tops mantle or, you know, the the page in that set or a 50 Bowman Jackie, where you're talking hundreds of dollars of difference based on one numerical grade. Uh, so that discussion, that back and forth doesn't happen as often uh, for me operating in the realm of lower grade. And really and truly, it's it's like anything else. If I say, Hey, JT, you know, you've got this really cool 56 tops, Aaron, 
in your case and you've got it priced like a six, but I think it should be priced like something that will grade a three as a rock art. And I don't like your price. I'm just going to go to the next table. <laughs> you know, that is a good, a good point because I've seen that a lot too, is that when I've been looking to buy raw um, for vintage, a lot of times I, I find that the dealers that are most flexible with it are the ones who have the, the well-loved, we'll call them examples, where um, they're cards that probably even when greeting was more affordable in terms of you're seeing bulk rates for maybe even single digit prices, it's not necessarily things that people would want to grade. And when we're saying this, uh, for anyone who's listening, the topic of grading it is that we're, it's not necessarily implying that everything should be graded. And that's not what I mean to say at all when we're talking about this. Yeah. Like the way we're just talking about in general, that there is this mindset often of, you know, what is, you know, we're trying to base off of condition and when it's raw, um, when you say like, okay, well, it's in this condition, it's, it's easier to kind of assign, like, what do we think a numerical grade would be, which is essentially what slabbing is. It's just, it's manifesting itself in a different conversation. So just a point of clarification for anyone listening, but yeah, I think you're right. Um, most of the time when I see what I think is really overpriced for a card, it is because it is probably mid grade, like at least mm-hmm. a five or a six. And you have people who maybe have those rose tinted glasses on. You think like, yeah, this is easy. If you send this PSA, this is seven or eight every day of the week. Mm -hmm. Um, And you as the buyer kind of, because it's not your card, you don't have as much of a bias towards it. Now your bias may be more towards it. You want to get it for as cheap as possible. So maybe you are more prone to notice the flaws as a point of contention when you are going to negotiate to say, well, it does have this flaw. Maybe it should be worth a little bit less. So I definitely see what you're saying there but yeah the way that you're doing it with buying the low grade vintage it makes perfect sense because there's just not as much debate and really a one and a two is kind of, to me it's it's very similar to um like in in modern terms a nine or a ten like mm-hmm. there's a lot of ones out there and one holders that could be twos and vice versa um are you talking more so the mid grades i think that's where you start to get a lot of variance but we'll, we'll move into variance here When you do buy graded cards, do you find it advantageous that there is that assigned grade already there on it where the condition is little, is it still up to interpretation? Yes, I would say, because like we mentioned, not all grades are created equal, but do you find that it is easier than find a good eye appeal card that is in a holder? Or do you think that um, the grade can be a hindrance maybe sometimes if you are going to buy something that is slept? So I I think kind of what we've, it plays into what we've been talking about already that with things that just using the standardization of a, a one or a two, that truly in that realm, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Like it, it really is eye appeal. That's all that matters. Everybody knows it's, you know, not a really nice card. Everybody's on the same page there. Where the higher you go up on that spectrum, the more technical it becomes. And I guess the more, inclined you are to have a sharp opinion one way or the other. Uh, So if a card is graded and it is one or a two, to me, it's pretty cut and dried. It's, it's a one or a two, man. Like, you know, unless it's a mantle or a key rookie card, almost why'd you get it graded? You know, (laughs) where if it's mid grade or high grade, you know, that matters whether it's a seven as compared to an eight, you know, you're talking hundreds of dollars of difference over you and I may not see eye to eye of, yeah, maybe this card's in an eight. It should have been a seven. I want it for $400 less. Or you're like, no, it's, it's in an eight. I want $400 more. Where I think like you mentioned the, the well-loved cards that most dealers uh, as well as most collectors that collect those type of cards are more willing to negotiate give or take based on, I like the look of this card. That's fair enough. And I, I've seen that example too, if you buying vintage cards, we we basically bought one together at we a did. show that we, that we went to. Um, and it was in, the, correct me if I'm wrong, SGC one and a half holder was what it was in. It and was. Yeah, it, well, it was, <laughs> not anymore. But um, when it was in that holder uh, and just looking at the this card, it's a beautiful example of this card. You, you can tell about it. You know, what, what is the card? I'll, I'll let you introduce it. Mm. I, 
You keep talking. I'll actually grab it for those that are on YouTube. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's even better. We'll give them a visual. So we made this uh, transaction at a show that I went to in, in Jake's neck of the woods uh, back in December for a card to add to his collection. It's it's cool because it, it is a Braves card too, so it's nice to have. He'll show it for you here. If you're watching us here on YouTube, if you're listening on Spotify or somewhere else there, you see it right there. And, I mean, when he shows it like that, that to me just from you know an arm's length away i know it's digitally he's, he's across the screen here uh would that really look out of place if it was in like a three or four holder uh, not one bit it's a uh 1948 bowman warren spawn rookie uh and i mean especially for my collection jt <laughs> this is a sharp card man i mean edges corners look pretty good you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a three or four. Centering's nice, uh, but and it's hard to tell, you know, digitally here. But if you had this card in hand, on the back, if you look at it, you can tell if you tilt it, there's residue all the way around the edges of the card where it was apparently, you know, in a scrapbook or, you know, pasted to somebody's wall, something like that. But in hand, unless I tilt it, you cannot tell. No paper loss, no anything like that. It's just if you tilt it, you can tell that it was it was pasted in something. It's quite remarkable that the back of it is as clean as it is having been pasted. Like <clears throat> I would expect, I, I put something in a scrapbook and I'm going to rip it out. You're mm -hmm. taking some of that paper with you more often than not if, if you're going to do something like that or anything that's similar. So it is truly remarkable that that card is like that. But it was in the SGC one and a half holder and a lot of the grading companies you'll find that there are certain things that will automatically knock you down to a certain grade. So mm -hmm. a common one we see is uh, sometimes in the group submissions that I run, you'll see a modern card that will come back a five and it's because it has a very small wrinkle on it. And if you have a wrinkle on your card and you send it to PSA, there is no way around it. You will get a five. There's just nothing that will happen. If you have a small pinhole because little Johnny had mm -hmm. it, you know, pinned up on his wall at home when he was a kid, it is a one. And there, you know, you could have the most beautifully centered, fantastic registration, sharp corners. If that kid put it up on the wall, it is a one. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of one of the things that we see sometimes with the grades is that the grade doesn't always tell the story. Are those the types of cards that, that you're looking for? Like a, a common thing that I hear is that there's an issue on the back. And that's why people mm -hmm. go for it is because, well, who looks at the back of the card and you know there people do like the backs of the cards too but the front of it i mean if you're willing to compromise something on the back you can get some extraordinary looking cards uh just looking at the front if you're you know maybe there's a little bit of paper loss over the text on the back or something are those the types of things that you look for or is that um you know something that doesn't present itself too often i do know people and collectors that are like that that you know they say I'm going to display the card. I'm not going to look at the back. You know, I'm displaying the front. Um, for me personally, I like to read the backs. Uh, I think they're really interesting. Uh, just the way some of them are written, you know, during the time frame that they were made and everything, um, especially during wartime to read some of those and how they talk about that time is just really interesting to me. It's, it's like reading a history textbook from the baseball standpoint. Um, so I don't like paper loss on the back. Uh, but I do tend to look for cards kind of along the same lines of if I hear the dealer say something like, oh, yeah, it's a lower grade card or, oh, yeah, it has this flaw. Like he points it out before I even ask about the card. I'm probably going to buy that card because they view it as a lesser card already in their minds. Therefore, it has less value associated with it. Ergo, I get a better deal on what I want to purchase. Um so everybody has, you know, their little little ticks that they like or don't like, regardless of what end of the spectrum they create. Like vintage on, you you mentioned pinholes, you know, or automatically ones. I hate pinholes. I can't do pinholes. Um, or missing pieces of the card or, or writing on the front. I, I can't do those. Those are no-nos for me. Um, but some people are okay with that. And, you know, I have a, uh, a 1933 Gaudi of i think it's my joe cronin that has a teeny tiny little pencil star drawn on the back 
And I looked at it. I flip it over. I see the star on the back and I go, oh, it's got that star on the back. I usually don't do writing. But when it was about 20% of what I expected to pay for the card, because the dealer was like, oh, yeah, it's got writing on the back. It's XYZ price. Okay, now I'm a buyer. That card's almost 100 years old and it's a Hall of Famer. Um, maybe I'll replace it someday. Maybe not. But I can live with it at that price uh, because it's a small mark. It's on the back. Okay. Uh, and I think that speaks to eye appeal. I think everyone has to decide kind of which factors matter to them the most, which ones they can live with, which ones they, they can live without, um, and kind of order them in their head, whether they consciously do it or not. Yeah, I mean, uh, on cards like that, you just have to make concessions unless you are made of money. Like You, you are not going to get something that's perfect and the lower the grade that you were to go, if you were to buy a graded or if you're buying it raw, the lesser condition that you would find, the more concessions you have to make. I mean, with a one in, in terms of if it is graded or if it's just in poor condition in general, you can only expect so much out of it unless, mm -hmm. like, you know, if, if pinholes were to not, if, if you're someone listening here and pinholes don't bother you, there's just this little tiny pinhole in it and that's the only issue with it, then that's the perfect card for you. Mm -hmm. um, but there's just, I, I think what you said there is absolutely perfect is that we all have different ticks. There are certain things that bug us. I mean, some of the things that you said there, like those are concessions that I would be like, yeah, sure, let's do it. You know, I'll, I'll take that card because that's something that isn't maybe as important to me. Um, but it, it varies from collector to collector. And I think mm -hmm. having a priority is good to really wrap up here today. We always like to kind of, um, we want, we want you to take away something from listening to the show, my, my guest and I, uh, regardless of whatever the topic may be, so that you can apply it to your own. So I'm sure that there's been some takeaways and you gave some just good advice there with kind of prioritizing on your list what is most important to you. Um, alongside that, what other advice would you give for people when they're trying to determine which kind of vintage cards they want to add to their collection and determining what eye appeal is to them? Because I think it's, it's something that probably varies from person to person it's beauty in the eye of the beholder so mm -hmm. what kind of general advice can you give for someone who's trying to make the most informed and decision that they'll ultimately be most pleased with when they end up buying the card i'm gonna i'm gonna start with an often used cliche in our community and reverse engineer from there all right start with collect what you love okay if you start with that in the thread of eye appeal reverse engineer from that why do i love this card why do I love this card I want to go after? Is it because it is a high grade? Or is it because I want to own this copy of the card? And how low of an example am I willing to go to be able to own this card? Where do those intersect on that axis? You know, I'm not okay with pinholes, but I am okay with a mark on the back because I'm going to display the front and I would love to own a 55 tops Clemente or I'm not going to love, you know, my Al K line 54 tops rookie unless it looks so nice to me that it would be the equivalent of a six. So I think in terms of eye appeal, if you've never really thought about it, my advice would be, you know, take a little time. You know, we all spend time on our collections, you know, take a sticky note out, write down the things that JT and I are talking about. You know, write down centering, surface, marks, paper loss, pinholes, you know, all the different aspects of a card, registration, color, and go through those and, and try and put them in order. Or maybe you just cross out the ones that aren't important to you and you circle the ones that are and kind of, I guess, get in your own head a little bit. You know, what's the psychology behind what goes into why do I love collecting this? Why do I love this card? Why would I buy that card? Um, so that would be my advice to anybody if they want to think about eye appeal and, uh, you know, try and use what we've been talking about today to their benefit. Listen to this man. He knows what he's talking about. That, that <laughs> is so perfectly said. I'm not going to add anything to it. I, I totally agree with everything that you just said there. Yeah. Just understanding what appeals to you. Cause what, what we talked about today, we talked about some of our own ticks and, a little bit behind the process of our decision making, but the process is still going to be different for everyone. So yeah, exactly what you said, you know, you got to find what works best for you, but these are the things that you can consider. So, so always we like to uh, 
leave with uh, how we can find the guests. So Jake, tell everyone about where they can find you if they want to hear more about your collection and kind of uh, see what you're doing. You got a lot of great things going on. I know you get the YouTube uh, Hall of Fame going on right now as well. So a lot of excitement around that and you have a very impressive collection. So let's hear about uh, where we can find you. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, first of all, on YouTube, you can find me as Legends Never Die. Uh, I am the new commissioner of the YouTube Sports Card Hall of Fame. If you haven't casted about and you've been making content for at least a year and you're still listening to JT and I, go cast a ballot uh, before the end of January. I'd love to check it out. I'd love to have you participate in something we do for the community to help discover a lot of great channels. You know, that's what it's all about. Um, so I'm Legends Never Die on YouTube. On Instagram, uh, I just surpassed 300 followers. Go me. Uh, it's Legends Never Die Collection. Uh, and I also have a personal website, which is legendsneverdiecollection.weebly.com. Um, if you've never looked at my website, you could get lost for hours and hours and hours. So if you're really bored, um, you can go check out my collection website as well. There you have it. I, I love the brand symmetry. I try to do that with all of my channels too, to get it uh, kind of the same two names really in, in all those places. So I love it. He's, he's, a cons he's consistent. Uh, it's good branding there. So thank you everyone for taking your time to listen to us today. We really hope that you were able to take away from something or at least you were entertained. I think we're pretty funny guys. So <laughs> at least you can uh, hang your hat on that if nothing else. Um, be sure to check out all the links in the description down below to find me on social media, anywhere that you may see. Also, if you're looking to buy some cards with some nice eye appeal, you can always check out my eBay store, Triple Crown 24 Sports Cards, linked in the description below. We'll also have links in the description below on the YouTube side if you want to go check out Jake's channel. And then from there, you can find him on Instagram and his website as well to keep up to date with what he is doing. So. Thank you again so much for listening. We'll be sure to see you next Thursday with a new episode of Sports Card Psychology. Until then, take care, stay safe, and be kind.